Okay, today on the bench we have yet another Cobra 2000 GTL. Uh, I think the customer said um, he bought this from the original owners and it's never really been transmitted on. <laughs> it's the only thing they ever really used it for was receiving. I guess they like to listen to the radio. Um, so, yeah, it, one owner other than the guy that's got it and he's, you know, he got it and sent it in so yeah this is in like one owner condition it is really nice shape um, definitely has seen some use it definitely has the fuzzy wuzzies growing in it <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to assume that the transmit section of this radio is probably in uh, great shape so you know pre-driver driver final transistors are probably still like new you know they never talked on it ah, they've never been used really um, he did note one fault with this. The frequency counter stuck on like, um, hell, I can't remember what the hell did they get stuck on 92.000 megahertz, I think. Um, we'll have to check on that. He's, you know, kind of concerned how much that might cost to fix it. And I told him, well, honestly, a lot of times, uh, you know, I recap because what he wants done is he wants the radio recapped. Um, an alignment done he does want a channel king board installed but I told him a lot of times when I take the frequency counter modules out and I recap them well of course I've got the board out I'm going to check it for bad solder joints uh, the some of these boards just have horrible and it's not so much that the solder joints were bad and I've shown this in other videos the solder just pops loose it's it's like it was either poor solder or the circuit boards were the copper was just a poor material or maybe it was the flux that they used the solder, excuse me, didn't have proper uh, wetting properties and didn't stick to the copper trace properly, but they just pop loose. It's not that they break out. They literally can take your fingernail and, and just pop up the solder joints. They just Components will just be bouncing around. And no solder on the trace. It just, the solder just like delaminates off of the copper traces. I've seen that happen. Um, yeah, there's a pair of FETs in here that can go bad, but uh, another thing that can cause problems in these uh, is if you have problems in your uh, synthesizer circuit over here, that can cause problems over here. Because this, unlike pretty much any other CB radio made back in the day, well, even even back then, honestly, there <laughs> I don't think there was anything else that had a frequency counter till you get up to modern times. But uh, the frequency counter in this is actually a frequency counter. It is not a frequency display. So there are a lot of radios out there that have what I call dumb displays. Dumb displays are just that. They know that when you put the channel selector on whatever channel, if it, you know, it's channel 19, it just knows that it needs to display 27.185. It doesn't matter what frequency the radio is actually on. If the radio is, if the channel selector is on channel 19, the display is going to show 27.185. This is not one of those radios. This actually has a true frequency counter. So just turning the clarifier will change the frequency. If, and that's a tuned circuit. If the output of the synthesizer circuit is low, it may not have enough signal level for the frequency counter to operate. There's actually two freq, well, there's one frequency, it depends. You can see there's actually two coax cables here. One comes down right here, and the other one up here. Uh, and that depends on what mode you're in. But if the inputs from those aren't high enough for this frequency counter, you can have problems. It won't display anything. It'll just display some random stuff where it might bounce around a lot. Um, if this isn't aligned properly, there's also two uh, tunable transformers inside of this. If they're not tuned properly, that's going to affect the input level into the, the amplifier circuits in this frequency counter module. Again, it won't work right. So a lot of times, just recapping a radio, checking for bad solder joints, and an alignment will fix a lot of frequency counter problems. So that'll, that'll remain to be seen. But I thought I'd show this one. Um, yes, it's got ah, vintage dust. <laughs> so take a close look here and just see how fuzzy this thing is. It definitely has the fuzz... The fuzzy wuzzies going on down here, but what's really nice to see is I don't see any modifications. It is modification free. Looks like the modulation limiter circuits, AMC, ALC circuits. Um, yeah, untouched power adjustments aren't. There's no adjustments in here that are cranked to the maximum. So yeah, it's. I'd have to agree. Probably these people bought it and that's all they ever did was received with it. <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, it's, uh, we'll have to take him at his word on that. But yeah, there's no signs that anybody's ever been in here tinkering around. Oh, actually, let's 
Uh, let me vacuum off some of this dust before I get a cloud going here. So we're going to have the vacuum cleaner on. Just get the color popped off here and see what it looks like in there. Yeah, looks nice and clean. Nothing, can't say I see anything obvious. No. Nothing let the magic smoke out, <laughs> put it that way. So, uh, let's see, how does this look for glue? Uh, this one doesn't look too bad. It's going to have the glue. You know, it's got the glue around all the ferrite beads like they normally do, but it's nice to see that down at the PLL, which is a common problem in these radios, or any radio that uses this chassis, is when they pour glue around this blasted capacitor here, it would leach over and get onto like a one or two of the pins at a PLL, and it would literally eat the pins off of it. So that doesn't look bad. It doesn't look like the glue even made it down to the circuit board level here. There's a little bit in the corner, a little bit here, and there should be a little bit on the back side here. But yeah, it doesn't even look like it made it down to the VCO block. So <laughs> that'd be a nice change. You won't have to remove that to clean it off either. <laughs> so, but uh, so let me get to a uh, vacuolating first because that's the first thing I need to do. And actually, take a gander at the bottom side and see that. This has also not had any modifications on the bottom from the looks of it either. Looks all original. Clarifiers still locked. No modifications there. No wires run over for power. The PLL area is as it left the factory. No cut traces. There's no hodgepodgery going on in the final section. So yeah, no high power splatter box mods there. Um, the only components that are bodged on the bottom of the board are factory. So those two diodes and that resistor, and then that resistor varies from radio to radio, but that's part of the tuning in this. <laughs> but uh, they did it to factory. But yeah, looks all original. So really, really nice radio in nice condition. So like I say, first thing I need to do is get all the get about a half pound of dust sucked out of this thing, and then uh, I'll recap it and uh, we'll. See how I also have to install the, install the channel king board and do the alignment and uh, see if that fixes the frequency counter problem. And if not, we'll do some uh, diagnostics on that. Maybe run through diagnostics if it is any anything else wrong with that. So I'll be back. Okay, so actually haven't really done much to it <laughs> other than I did turn it on. I vacuumed it out and turned it on. Um, I just wanted to show. Yes, it does. Frequency counter is yeah, it's goofy. Ninety two point nine, and if you transmit, yeah, it just it goes down one <laughs> so yeah has problems there like i say if uh recapping this checking it for you know bad solder connections and the alignment doesn't doesn't get the counter working we'll do some diagnostics on that but wow what just a few minutes and not not that long uh just a little bit of work with a vacuum cleaner and a dust brush look at that <laughs> that, that looks a lot different than it did just a few short minutes ago so much cleaner and actually this does have a considerable amount of glue in it but uh, don't think it's going to be too bad like i say even now that i've cleaned it out and i can really see the board doesn't look like anything touching the pll looks like the vco is fine but yeah they hit her pretty hard in some other spots you can see it's all all around there uh, i'm trying to look through the viewfinder which is kind of hard here where are we at right here there's just a huge glob of glue there all down around the capacitor yeah, it's all oozed out all over here but it's it's not what I call juicy glue but you see that it's still semi flexible so yeah it's it, it looks like it should come off pretty easily and it doesn't really look like it's gotten corrosive um, so that shouldn't be too bad I've seen some radios where a lot of times there's a lot of it around here there's none thank God <laughs> so yeah this one's looking good uh, good earlier radio with a full-size crystal. These are just more stable than uh, other. You see these radios with a small crystal, you know, small packaged crystal. These are more stable because they're bigger. So bigger is better when it comes to crystals. <laughs> but yeah, so you know, a little the glue that's normally on the 455 ceramic filter there. I'll get that popped out and cleaned off. So yeah, there's a little bit of glue around the board, but it doesn't. And there's some back around that transistor right there. You can see it's all oozed out. It's around all the leads on that. But 
even with this plastic, just this plastic spudger, you can see how easily that stuff's coming up. So, still a little bit rubbery. Doesn't look like it's really gotten corrosive or conductive yet, so... Woohoo! Kind of can't see my hands, but <laughs> thumbs up there. <laughs> a lot less work to do. So, let me get to it, and I'll be back. Okay, so the radio has been recapped now. Uh, cleaned the controls. Cleaned the circuit board. Um, anything else I did? <laughs> I'm trying to think here. Uh, that's about it. Um, cap, yeah, that's pretty much it to this point. Oh, no, and I did because the counter, as you can see, is still not reading correctly. That's what I've, this section of the video is for. Um, as soon as I turned it on, I saw it was still reading 92.9 megahertz. Um, I then uh, did the alignment procedure on the synthesizer circuit. I have not installed the channel king board yet. As soon as I got this done, I wanted to make sure this problem was either here or gone before I go on and do a modification and then you know you never know did your modification cause the problem so the problem was still here I wanted to make sure that the synthesizer circuit everything was working fine there so I did the alignment on the PLL synthesizer circuit it's fine spot on now uh, and as you can see the frequency counter is still not working right and this is a common problem in these reading this 92.90 uh, a loss of signal um, in the radio can cause that, and, but usually if the problem is in the radio, it's, I mean, I realize the frequency counter is in the radio, but <laughs> if, you're, if your frequency counter is showing that and you don't have receive or transmit, well, then you've got probably a synthesizer problem. If you have receive and transmit and you're receiving and transmitting on the, you know, the correct frequency, then your problem is probably in your frequency counter. Um, any loss of signal can cause that. So, you know, it can be two things that cause that to show up. Problem in the counter or a problem in the radio. I have verified the problem's not in the radio. Because actually, if we take a look up here at the scope, I'll take a scope probe and probe at the input for our 35 megahertz signal, which is in AM is what it should be getting. And there we have and it. it that changes from channel to channel. This frequency is actually somewhere between the high 34 megahertz and 35 megahertz range. But I can see, like right now, we got 34 point like 985 megahertz. But that's the input into this frequency counter module. Now, if we look at the schematic for the frequency counter, I actually have a couple of them here. This is a factory Cobra schematic here. which sometimes the factory schematic's better than the SAMS manual. There are other times that the SAMS manual's a little bit better. This is one of those cases where I kind of like the SAMS manual schematic a little bit better, but they both show the same thing. So here's our third, whoop, just off the page, 35 megahertz signal comes in. So you can see we actually have two signals come in. Uh, this one's only used when you're in sideband, so we can basically ignore this circuit down here. In AM, it's only using this one. So the signal comes in. Uh, there's a buffer amplifier stage here. It's a FET. If that goes bad, that can cause the problem that we're seeing. Anything that stops this signal from getting into the counter circuit can cause this problem. Um, goes through a transformer. This is tuned. And then it goes into this little IC right here. And that IC is one of these. It was made by Plesley back in the day. You can see it's a RF-IF amplifier. Very simple little circuit. Um, they actually had two different data sheets. This one's a little bit easier to follow here. The other the other, other one that they printed out. But you can see basically in a nutshell you have an input. You've got VCC which is your voltage source. You've got ground, input bias, um, and then this one pin uh, these two terminals are across that transformer. When I get back to the schematic, you can look at it. But it's an amplifier stage and then an output. That's it. That's all that IC does. Okay. So what we should see is, signal comes in here. If we probe at pin 5, which is actually the test point used when you're doing the alignment to, to peak this transformer here, we should see this, this signal amplified at this point. Now it's not going to be a huge amplification, but the signal should be bigger here at the input than it was here at the input to the counter module. Because remember, it's been amplified by this FET. So if I do that, if I go to pin 5, 
Oh, I guess it would help if I went back up to the oscilloscope screen there so you can see it. <laughs> but do you much good looking at the page down here to pin 5. And, oh, come on, get on there, probe. Okay, there's pin 5, 34.985. So there's the signal into the counter module, or into the IC. And there's the signal from the, uh, coming into the actual frequency counter module. So you can see we got about, about 300 millivolts peak to peak. If we go to the input of the IC, Oh, for Pete's sakes, my ground is jumping around here. Actually, my readings are getting all thrown out of whack there. <laughs> Let me find a better ground to clip onto. See if that's better. Okay, that's more stable. <laughs> so, there's about 400 millivolts peak to peak, and that's the input into the frequency counter module. So, that's being fed into that FET, which goes through the FET, through the tuned transformer, and then this is the input to the IC at pin 5. So we got 730 millivolts peak to peak. So we have an increase. And if we look back down at the schematic, actually the SAMS manual is laying right underneath of it. Same exact circuit. We have the input, goes through the FET, tune transformer, input, and then, you know, as long as we have voltage, which I have confirmed, I do have voltage into the IC, we should see a much larger signal right here at the output that goes into this 74 ls 0 uh, NAND gate. It's a two-input quad NAND gate IC. Um, as long as our signal coming in here is bigger coming out here, then this IC is good. If not, then it's bad. So we'll go back up to the scope screen. Go back to pin 5 again, the input. So there's our input signal. And now if I go over to pin 3, yeah, there's our output. Basically nothing. There's a little bit of noise there. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just a little bit of noise. That's about all there is there is noise. So we have good input. I have confirmed there's the input again. I've confirmed it has an input signal. I've confirmed that it has good... Uh, voltage and ground connections so the only thing that can be <laughs> basically would be this IC now there is one other thing that could cause that um, and that is if this uh, two input quad NAND gate is bad uh, I suppose that could be drawing the signal to ground you know if this input on this IC was shorted out internally to ground that would be sinking our signal which would eat it up and that's basically what we'd see would be just that um, I would still expect to see a little bit of signal here possibly because it does have to go through some circuit traces on the board to get from the output here to the input and you know, I'd, but yeah there's really nothing there so I'm gonna say that IC is bad so I'm gonna pop that out now um, and that is what I've been probing at is so when I was probing the input into the counter module, that's this coax cable right here comes up, and you actually have a test point right here. This test point is the same as this coax cable, okay? But I was just probing right here at the input for the 35 megahertz signal, and then I was probing at pin 5, which is right here on this IC, and we had good input signal. So you have the input, goes through the FET, tune transformer, into the IC and then in sideband this other input is this cable here is used in sideband and you'll have uh, which our problem is in AM and in sideband so that kind of much we don't have to worry about this circuit we know it's going to be the problems in this circuit um, but like I say it goes into this little uh, RFIF amplifier and it's not amplifying but uh, it comes out of this and then goes into this 74 LS double O and so let me pull the frequency counter module back out I'll pop in a new IC and we'll see if that fixes it luckily I do have those <laughs> they haven't made those things for years but I do have still have a stick of those latched onto a bunch of those so let me get one of those stuck in there and see if we can get this frequency counter reading properly again okay IC's been replaced there's the old one got the new one installed now Actually, not so new. You can see it's what 
19, just looking at the date code through the camera of viewfinder here, was it like 1984? <laughs> so that IC is actually older than this radio. That's an early one. But, turn the radio on. Ta-da! Hey, we actually have a radio frequency now. And... direction. Let's see if we can get her into... There we go. Even reads correctly. Look at that. Switch modes. And looks good. Change channels. There we go. That's all it was. Bad IC. So, if you have one of these, like I say, they're I'm not going to sit here and try to explain the entire, <laughs> especially in a, in a video on a radio, the entire functioning of how this frequency counter module works. But most of the time in my experience, um, now I have had other components in these go bad. It, it does happen. Um, now, all of them can be had to, even though this IC, the one that I changed, okay, this little SL uh 1611, I think it is. Let me look at you. 1611C. Um, even though they're not made anymore, there's still still a suppliers that have these for sale. Like I said, I, I, I did years ago. I bought, uh, I think it was like 200 of them just so I had them. Um, knowing that, you know, they're eventually going to become unobtainium. Um, but the one part that is, is unobtainium in these is this IC right here. Okay. This is a custom masked ROM. That's the heart, that's the, if you look down in here, that's that little guy right there, okay? That is a custom mask ROM. What that means is it's programmed, and it was programmed by the manufacturer of the IC. So, yeah, if that one goes bad, yeah, you're screwed. You may be able to find a TMS-1000. The problem is you're not going to find a TMS-1000 with the proper program on it. <laughs> so, yeah, the only place to get one of those is out of another frequency counter module. But everything else in this module is replaceable. Uh, the common problems you'll usually see, and it's one thing I always suggest, when, and when I rebuild these, um, you know, when I'm recapping it, but might as well consider that rebuilding, um, I, you know, check to see if it's, one of the counter modules for starters that has the the bad solder joints like I was talking about this was one of them I actually took my fingernail underneath I don't remember which of these transistors on the back but really hard pushed on with my fingernail and it popped up so yes this is one of the ones that has the bad <laughs> the and I honestly think it's the copper it's the copper that was used on these boards just for some reason it it oxidizes and the solder pops loose and you'll find that even if you clean off the trace Take a fiberglass brush, a stiff bristle one, you know, like a, a rush eraser or one of those, and and clean the trace down to bare copper, you still have a hard time getting solder to stick to those blasted things with anything other than RA flux. So yeah, you have to use an activated flux to really get good a good bond or good wetting action on these the copper. Like I said, that's anything I can figure. It's just was a crappy batch of copper. <laughs> but um, I had fixed all that. The one thing I always recommend you do on these, it's one thing I do when I'm recapping them and doing the solder, is that Zener diode right there, uh, from the factory it was a half watt Zener diode. Do yourself a favor, increase that to a one watt Zener diode. Same, same voltage value, just change that to a one watt uh, so it can handle a little bit more power. Those are those are known for going bad. The other things that commonly go bad in these are these FETs. Uh, FETs are static sensitive, and these are right at the input. So yeah, if any, if there was ever a high ESD event, not so much a lightning strike, but you know, with an antenna and there was some high ESD, those can take a take a hit. Um, so you know, if you see signal in again, just like I just showed, you know. The little segment before this, if you have good signal coming in and you don't have a good signal after the transformer, and the two test points are right here, so you could easily test both of these. Check at the input for your 34 to 35 megahertz on this back cable. You check at pin 5 on this IC, and then for this cable, this is your 7.8 oscillator circuit used in sideband for the frequency counter, and what that does is that way it knows what the offset is. Um, it uses that to, to reference for the offset. That's this test point right here. So again, basically the same circuit comes in this cable, gets amplified by this FET, goes through a tuned circuit, and this is the test point for that. 
So if you have a signal here and you don't have a, you know, your 35 megahertz, you don't have a signal at the pin 5 on this IC, or your 7.8 megahertz, you've got a signal here, but you don't have a signal at this test point right here, you probably have a problem with the FETs. Um, so there you go. Like I said, I just thought I'd, I'd show that. that. Yes, recapped it. That didn't fix it. And that's what was wrong with that IC. So now I can install the uh, Channel King board in this because the radio is back working like a factory radio. The only other problem it actually does have is, and the customer had noted that, was the needle stuck. So I do need to pop the meters out. This one's actually free, but I have to take the bracket out, pop that meter out, and get the needle unstuck. But other than that, our, like I say, our frequency counter is working. That's, that's the main thing. So, and it does read correctly, like I say, when we switch to sideband. Because when you switch to sideband, you're also going to have the signal coming in on this 7.8 megahertz, which is needed. That's, that sets the offset so the frequency counter still reads correctly. So, actually, that's one reason this will read correctly. And if you have a radio that uses pretty much any chassis, but, you know, let's say specifically a chassis like this, like a Cobra 148, and you put on one of those aftermarket frequency counters, a lot of times when you put those frequency counters on radios, if it's not for a radio that was designed for those counters, they will work. The problem is, is when you switch to sideband, the frequency counter's off. Depending on the radio, will be off like 1.5 kilohertz or 2.5 kilohertz. It's off by whatever the, the sideband offset frequency is that's being used in the radio. These don't have that problem because this counter was designed to have the second frequency input there, so this counter knows what mode it's in. And it actually take a second for the scope to boot up. We'll just get that to boot up. And uh, which probe do we have here? That'd be this one. Once that boots up, what I'll do is, is I'll just stick the probe. Actually, I'll be able to get this on camera probably. I get the camera to stay up high enough. Okay, so I have the radio on AM. If I put the scope probe in that rear, in the rear one for our 35 megahertz, you can see we have our 35 megahertz signal. And if I stick it in the front one here, you can see there's nothing there. Now what I'm going to do is, is switch the radio into sideband. And you can see it's low, but there is a signal there. It's just not as big. But that's, you know, 7.985 right there. But that's in the front. And then when I switch, uh, if I get the camera back far enough so you can actually see me switching the knob. You know, I go to AM, it goes away. I go to the you know, upper side band. There's our 7.8 megahertz range signal. AM sideband. But that's why these counters will read correctly when you're in sideband and they don't don't reflect that offset frequency on the display is because of that line. So there you go. So let me get the uh, Channel King board in and we get back. We should have a three three digit display there. That's about the only guy you're going to hear at the moment. I've come to one conclusion. This camera repels radio signals. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I swear in the last month, of course, this you know, skip's just slowly starting to come back in. But I swear, I'll have, before I start an alignment or do anything on camera, I'll turn the radio on, I'll have Skip, may not be booming in on all channels, but I'll have it on several channels, have some sideband to listen to. I get done with the radio, the instant I turn the camera on, flip the radio back on, and yeah, the Skip's all gone. <laughs> I swear, it's, this thing has a RF signal repel mode that I haven't found yet and turned off. But, uh, so the radio's done now. Uh, good work in radio, got the range set from minus 50 to 200, so it's got 250 channels. Instead of spinning, it's one of the nice things about the Channel King board. You have your home channel, which is really simple to get to. Uh, you set your home channel, so you know if you're up at some really high or low channel, you just push the encoder one time, do what they call a quick press, takes you back to whatever you have your home channel set to. Uh, of course, it has you know the Roger beeps, your favorites, 
uh, you know, your memory channels, scanning, um, and good work in radio. Uh, like I say, really didn't need a lot of work other than just the normal normal stuff you would do to a radio of this vintage. Um, it did have one actual fault that was the frequency counter, showed the, uh, the IC that was replaced in there, the little uh, RFIF amplifier that they use was bad, um, and other than that, put a channel king board in it. So really the only modification to this thing right now is the channel king board. Um, since it had never really been screwdriver before, the transmit was, <laughs> it was pretty much spot on as far as all the limiters. So the AMC, ALC, and the AM power were still uh, at factory levels. So they actually needed to be turned up a little bit <laughs> to get to the, you know, the actual alignment specifications because manufacturers always err on the side of caution and, you know, adjust them down a little bit. But, uh, Yep, good clean radio, so I just need to do one last final blowout of any dust bunnies that <laughs> might still be hiding in here. But, uh, oh, the controls, I cleaned the controls because, yeah, they were just horribly nasty. Just <laughs> and, and I made the mistake of touching the uh, CBPA switch here. Woo! I went from PA to CB, and... I didn't have anything. And, yeah, wiggle, 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 and, yeah, it finally came back in. So, yeah, I had put my, popped the... Uh, uh, two screws out of this and cleaned all the switches. That's the one thing about these switches, you can't get any cleaner into them with them mounted in the radio. Now they're fairly easy to, to take out. Uh, so if you ever have these switches, they get noisy on you, you know, either your speaker switch or, you know, any of them. If they become non-functional, they're just intermittent, they're dirty. That's all it is. Need to get a little bit of cleaner in there. Um, there's two screw, two Phillips screws, the mounting bracket that all those switches mount to. Take those two Phillips headed screws out, then you can pull You'll need to have all your switches straight out like that. You can pull it out, get some cleaner sprayed into all of them, um, and then just reinstall, and then just you know rock the switches back and forth a couple times to flush all the contaminants out. But uh, yep, turned out really nice. One little side note. Okay, sorry I had an interruption there. So back at it. <laughs> Anyhow, radio's pretty much done. Just need to put the covers back on and this be ready to send send back. Uh, one quick note: you may have noticed um, that's where I got cut off was. Uh, there's a meter sitting here on the bench. I have been looking for another one of these for forever. <laughs> They're just rare as hen's teeth, if not rarer. Um, it is a watt meter, so but it is a really nice one. I've got three of them. Well, actually, I have five of them, but I only have three of them that I can use because uh, the other two are missing the uh, SWR bridge the power meter and reflection bridge that mount plugs into the back of these. Uh, it is a old vintage signal crafters watt meter and SWR meter. So actually let's get over here so you can actually halfway see this thing. The camera leveled out here a little bit. So they're really nice meters. Uh, the reason I really like them is it's not your standard uh, cheap watt meter. You pick this thing up, it's got some weight to it. So, actually, let's just see. It's not your modern-day junk power meter like you see a lot of people using. So we'll turn on the scale here. Yeah, 5 pounds, 12 ounces. Now, there are some coax cables hooked up to it. I'm sure that's adding a few ounces, but, yeah, it's, it's over 5 pounds. <laughs> Turn that off. I mean, the case on these alone, it's, it's, it's probably a pound. <laughs> the faceplate and the internal structure is all aluminum, but this uh, cover is like, it's like that thick, really heavy gauge steel. Uh, I like these because, for starters, this is, well, may there's probably two. I think you could probably send an alpha watt meter to a true calibration lab. Um, you know, a, an accredited laboratory, and they will calibrate probably an alpha, but I know they will calibrate one of these because the three that I have that have the bridges on the back of them, um, I have had those calibrated by uh, accredited laboratories. Usually, if you ask a... a calibration laboratory to calibrate a watt meter unless it is a laboratory style meter they're going to tell you to yeah the front door is right over there 
<laughs> you can take your cheap piece of junk you know, in so many words and just walk right back out because we can't calibrate something that we can't stand behind because they're because they're junk. These, on the other hand, they will calibrate. Um, that's one of the things I really like. I can send this in and get a laboratory calibration with a laboratory with a you know calibration certificate that gives me uh, not only you know is it calibrated but also tells me depending on what the frequency I'm using and that's one of the things the uh, bridges on the back of these uh, cover certain frequency ranges but um, you know I can get a, a graph chart for this so if there is any discrepancy over the, the full frequency range of that bridge that gives me a calibration factor um, now what I do is is if I know what frequency I'm going to be using one of these watt meters on I will have them calibrate the meter at that frequency now I can use it at other frequencies as long as it's within that bridge's range, but uh, you know I'll then have to use that calibration factor to get an accurate reading. But like I said, I always get them to calibrate it at a specific frequency, one that I know I'll, I'll use as a my basically my reference standard frequency. Um, this one covers uh, 20 watts, 200 watts, or 2,000 watts. Now it has some really nice features because this is not your standard watt meter it's automatic <laughs> so if you actually push leave both of these buttons out it's fully automatic you can just key down into this thing and if it exceeds 20 watts it'll flip automatically it flips over to the 200 watt scale if it exceeds 200 watts it automatically flips over to the 2000 watt scale uh, anytime the needle gets up close gets up to full scale and that's another thing you don't have to worry about bending your needle with this thing if it gets up to that point it'll automatically auto range to the next range uh, and you can all, you can take it out of auto ranging just like I have it here. So you can you know, I have it set where it's locked at 20 watts. If I want to lock it at 200 watts, I would push this one back out, push this one in, and then if I want 2,000 watts, you see the little line goes around there. You would just push in both of them, and you can see now it's switched over to the 2,000 watt scale. Uh, this one does have one problem: this 20 watt button. Um, so right now it's in automatic. You know that's that's automatic. That's 20 watts, that's the 200 watt scale, and then both of them pushed in is 2,000 watts. You can see the problem with this meter. Thankfully, it's not an electronic problem. It's a mechanical problem with this switch, and I can probably get that freed up. Um, these old buttons do tend to do this. They have, if I slowly press in, you can see how that little black spot in the middle kind of splits in half, kind of like an eye opening. It's two little shutters that close around it. Same thing with the power switch. They, all the switches do that. You can see how it kind of opens in the middle, but that's mechanical. It's stuck on this 20 watt button, so I need to get that freed up. Uh, usually I'm successful with that. If it doesn't, I don't really care. <laughs> I usually just leave them in automatic anyhow. The other thing is this has a peak reading. Uh, this is a peak can be set for average. You can't see it. It's on underside there, but you can set it to average or to peak nice thing about this is it actually measures peak power really really good the accuracy of the meter is good to start with but it's actually very good on peak reading um, I can shove whatever signal I want into this thing you know if it's you know if I want to lock it on 20 watts I can take an average power reading or your RMS value and then take a peak reading and actually take a peak reading on an oscilloscope do the math to figure out what the peak to peak power is and then compare that with this meter. These meters are almost dead on every time. They're just very, a lot of meters. They, they may be accurate on average, but peak reading functions, yeah, most of the meters you see, they've their accuracy on peak varies widely. The main reason this meter is so accurate is is because it's an active meter. It's actually a, a couple of integrated circuits in here that actually handle this. I'll do a separate video on this at some point. Um, it also has uh, you can select uh, different dummy loads. Now they're not internal. There was a bunch of option, options you could get. I will, sh before I stop this video, I will show you the back of this thing so you can see. Here is the bridge. And like I say, you got these for different uh, frequency ranges. Uh, this one covers up to 30 megahertz and then they had other ones for higher frequency ranges. But it has you know, your standard inputs and outputs and then if I unplug this just take it off. You see there's actually two RCA jacks in the back so that's actually the the bridge right here and then the meter itself has a couple extra things you could get a few 
additional accessories for this thing. So you plug in, and so the meter would work for starters with different, several different frequency ranges depending on which optional coupler you got for it. Like I say, I have two more of these. I don't have couplers for them. They're nice meter. I just bought them. I knew they wouldn't do me any good because <laughs> without a coupler, it's useless. But uh, they're good for parts. If I ever need, let's say, a switch or a meter movement, and these the meters in these things are very high quality meters. Actually, you can see how thick the cabinet is here. That's what I was saying. Built like a tank. Um, but it has a couple extra uh, plugs on here. So you can see there's DC outputs for SWR and power. It's really nice. You could set this meter in one room. Um, you can also have you know, antenna relays, which I'll get to in a second. But if you set this meter in one room, you know, and that's the other thing. With this, with these RCA jacks, you can remote mount this coupler somewhere else and just run a pair of cables between the coupler and the meter head. Um, well, you can do the same thing. You could remote mount meter heads somewhere using these two outputs. These are DC outputs. So when this meter operates, you know, or the outputs of these is from zero to one volt. One volt representing full scale on the meters on the front of this this meter swings between zero to one volt on these. So you can run again two cables out from these to two remotely mounted meter heads and have two meters displaying. So you could even have a meters in another room displaying. Um, it also has antenna relays uh, you could get from signal crafters back in the day, they had an optional relay box that you could directly hook up to their watt meters. And they made a couple different models of their watt meters, but they actually ran out to uh, uh, relay controlled coax switches. So from this box, you could select different antennas. You could select you know, antenna one or antenna two. So just really nice meters, well protected. You can see double fused, you know, this is one of those things that really, I don't wanna say spare no expense, but man, they, they really went above and beyond. <laughs> Signal Crafters is still in business. Unfortunately, they have not made these meters in decades. <laughs> they still make some test equipment. And that's one of the reasons I think this meter is such high quality. And it's one of the few reasons you can get this calibrated by a cow lab is. That's what Signal Crafters is. They make instrumentation. Uh, mainly they make, I think, like ultra-low frequency uh, signal generators. I'm not into ultra-low frequency, but I guess they get into the... Uh, maybe like sonar type signal generators and whatnot, but they make they make instrumentation. They make high quality, you know, products, and I think that's probably why Cal Labs will certify these. Like I said, I'll do a separate video on this at some point. Um, I wanted to get another one specifically to use here at this bench. Uh, I've got, like I say, three other ones. Two of them are attached to uh, radio setups. I actually have one of the uh, factory. Uh, relay modules from Signal Crafters. Um, that one actually gets used on air. I've got another one's hooked up the radios and then the third one that I have that's in good working order is actually over on another repair bench but I wanted to have one of these at this bench because not only is the watt meter automatic notice there's nothing on the front here for SWR. There's no buttons, there's no knobs, there's no calibration, there's no nothing. Remember I said this is an active meter. It's so controlled, you know, solid state with integrated circuits. The SWR meter is completely hands-free. So you don't have to adjust anything. So you could switch between antennas. You don't have to worry about zeroing, you know, full scale. Normally with an SWR meter, you have to key your microphone, put it in calibrate, adjust for full scale deflection, then flip back over into SWR read and read your SWRs. This does it automatically with a, a comparator circuit so and that's basically all you're doing when you're doing that manual adjusting you're manually adjusting that that comparator it's just using a variable resistor where they're doing it automatically with this but uh, yeah so at some point in the future look forward look for a future video on this I'll do a tear down um, there's I haven't opened one of these up in quite a while <laughs> usually the only thing I ever have to do to these uh, now this one works just fine. I've had this hooked up to this radio works just fine and actually compared to other meters that I have that are laboratory calibrated This one's spot on but I do want to get the cal you know, get the, an actual cal sticker on this from a cal lab So I will send this out to get it calibrated um, But the one thing I always do to these and it's been man, several years since I had the covers off of one of these I think it's two electrolytic capacitors it might be three. Actually, I think it's two aluminum electrolytic capacitors and a power supply circuit. And I think there is one tantalum um, for line 
line filtering on the ICs for the, the uh, supply rail on the ICs. But I think that's it. The only thing is, it's a bit of a pain in the butt <laughs> getting to this because this this faceplate can be taken. It's just the assembly, and you'll see when I do the separate video. Taking it apart's a bit of a challenge. Um, now, like I say, the capacitors that are in this are fine, but yeah, if I'm going to set this up on a shelf somewhere, I don't want to ever have to take it apart again, so I'll go ahead and do that before I send it off to get calibrated. But yeah, I've wanted one of these here, because uh, I'm actually going to be installing probably one or two. The antennas that I use here at the bench are kind of honestly subpar. Um, I really don't talk on the radio here at all, other than occasionally, hey, radio check, and that's about the extent of it. I uh, want to switch over... I need to do some, again, some relay switching with some coax switches to run some of my antennas into this room, but be able to remotely switch them from the radio room into into different benches. So either this bench or my, you know, my other primary workbench. Um, so I want to be able to have a good power and SWR meter that, that it's automatic. That's the nice thing. It does both functions at the same time. You know, I've got other meters here. That one does S, you know, forward and reflected too, but I have to turn a knob. That's the nice thing about this. It's automatic. You can key the mic and watch your power, and if you change bands or you change power levels, you, know, you can watch the SWRs without having to adjust anything. It's really nice because it's handoff. Other than you have to turn it on. That's the only thing you have to do. And Yes, it's showing some oddball uh, reading right now because the bridge is not in, plugged into the back of it. <laughs> it's not going to read read properly because it doesn't have its sensor head attached. But uh, yeah, so in the future, look for a tear down, and uh, I guess you could call it a rebuild. Because like I say, I got to completely dismantle it to change those couple caps, clean the switches, just to make sure they're they're good for another 30 or 40 years. <laughs> uh, try and get this uh, get the eye opening on this switch so it actually closes. Like I say, usually there's a little finger and a little mechanical. There's a slot in the push button bar on that thing, and if that little finger pops out or if the tip of it breaks off, that little bar is what activates those those little windows that wrap around and close. And if that little bar pops up or breaks off, the, that's what happens. <laughs> and like I said, I've had to fix that in a few other, and not just these meters, actually other pieces of test equipment and some other stuff before. So yeah, future video there. Uh, I just uh, had gotten that earlier today. Uh, that's why it was on the bench. Um, mailman dropped that off, and then I had to stop the camera. The FedEx man had showed up. I actually had to go get a package. Had a bunch of, I've already put some of the other stuff away. I still got some enamel coated wire here to put away, some magnet wire. But uh, so that's why it was on the bench with this radio. I just I wanted to try it out. <laughs> You've got my new play toy, and I got it cheap. It was like 50 couple dollars plus shipping. I, I couldn't, hell, I'd pay 300 for one of these damn couplers right here if I could find a couple of them because like I say the meters are useless without these I've got two of them for spares and the thing is the other two meters I have work perfectly if I take the coupler off of another unit plug them into them they work just fine I just need two more of these blasted things but yeah as you can see they're easy they easy to take off so unfortunately over the decades they're easy to lose so any case uh, video was on this it's done let me get this uh thing closed up, boxed up, and sent off to the customer, and uh, he can put this into use.